Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning for the online worship service of the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ. Just settle into your harness, step off the platform, and let gravity do the rest. That's what the borderline hippie told me when I reached the last platform of the ropes course at Wolf Ridge Retreat Center in northern Minnesota. During the 25 years since, I've developed a tolerance for height, recognizing that sometimes I need to climb the ladder to get something done. But at that time, I hadn't come to that realization yet. And this barefoot child of Earth Day wasn't instilling a whole lot of confidence in me that he knew what he was talking about. There I was, standing on the edge of a six-by-six six platform prepared precariously situated some 40 feet above the earth. I had gutted it out to get there, but with time to think and the ground glaring angrily back up at me as if I had intentionally wronged it at some point, the finish line at the end of the zip line seemed a million miles away, and my impact with the ground seemed rather certain. Until I reached that final platform, I hadn't needed to test the security of my harness. And this guy, who I didn't know from Adam, was telling me to step off the platform and let gravity do the rest. That's what I was afraid of, that gravity would do the rest. While, I was trying to, while he was trying to talk me off the ledge, all I could think was, you have got to be kidding me. Unfortunately, that's the struggle many have with the promise of John 3.16. Can I really trust that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life? Jesus' invitation seems too simple. It's hard to believe that we don't have to do something to earn our salvation. It would be easier to grasp if we had to take the initiative by doing penance or going on a pilgrimage or praying some special prayer. Then we would have stock in our own salvation. Instead, Jesus simply asks us to trust in him and what he has done for us. This seems to be what, with what Nicodemus was struggling. Remember, it was his nighttime conversation with Jesus that set the stage for John 3.16. And Jesus' seemingly outlandish com command, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again, struck the scholar. And for that matter, it strikes most of us. We wonder, like, like I did on that rope scores, what we can do to keep ourselves from dying. What's our part in God's plan? Yet, yeah, like we talked about weeks ago, a baby's role in their birth is passive. They must simply submit to the movement of their mother, mother's body, or things go dreadfully wrong. Our salvation is equally as simple. God works, and we submit to his movement. Simply trusting God to work was hard for Nicodemus to grasp, though. He thought there had to be more to it than that. To help him, Jesus eased his, this, the visiting professor into the idea with an account from the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. The story Jesus told would have been a familiar one, but he may have never truly understood it until that moment. In John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, Jesus told Nicodemus, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life 
in him. With just this quick one-sentence reference, Nicodemus would have understood Jesus' point. And yet to us, it may still seem a bit cryptic. Why would Jesus precede the promise of John 3.16 with this strange reference to a serpent in the wilderness? The backstory is essential if we're going to understand Jesus' words. So here it is. The wandering Israelites were grumbling again against God and against Moses. Though they were traveling near the border of the Promised Land and had received decades of provisions from the, from the Lord, they were whining like spoiled children. In Numbers chapter 21, verse 5, they complained. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Their complaint was just like those before. They longed for their captivity. Dreaming of pyramids and cursing the wilderness, pining for Pharaoh and vilifying Moses. They were sick of the hot sand, the long days, and the manna. Verse 5, they went on. There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Can you imagine cursing the bread of heaven? They had eaten all the manna they could stomach, and God had put up with all the moaning he could tolerate. And in verse 6 we find, Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. When I was a kid, when my parents weren't looking, I watched a low-budget horror movie about a small town near a military installation. Researchers were doing genetic experimentation on venomous snakes, and, of course, the snakes got out. I didn't sleep for weeks, let alone take a bath. But that's a bit more than I want to share about the movie, at least for this sermon. Numbers chapter 21 was the real deal. Not just some cheesy movie meant to scare a little kid. Slithering vipers came up out of every crevice. They washed over the camp like a wave leaving death in their wake. People died, and their bodies dotted the landscape. The survivors pleaded with Moses to plead with God for mercy. And in Numbers chapter 21, verses 7 to 9, they cried out to Moses, and the, and the Lord responded, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then, when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. The story was a solemn prophecy and a simple promise. Those who were bitten by the snakes were healed by looking up to the bronze serpent on the pole. And those who are bitten by sin find healing by looking to Jesus and his sacrifice. Remember what Jesus said about himself, the Son of Man, in John chapter 3, verse 15. Everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. The simplicity of what Jesus was suggesting is hard for us to get our heads around. We expect God's answer for our problem with sin to be more complicated than it is. The Israelites probably expected a more elaborate situ solution as well. Apply a specially formulated ointment or 
or draw out the venom, or at least fight back, like in the horror movie that haunted my dreams. Break out the sticks and stones and go on the offensive against the snakes. That's what we want to do against our sin as well. Attack it with vengeance. But the more aggressive we get with our sin, the more our focus drifts away from Jesus. We want to conjure up our own remedy for sin, some form of penance. We want to don sackcloth and ashes. We want to climb cathedral steps on our knees. We want to traverse hot rocks with bare feet. Or maybe we just want to kick ourselves for messing up yet again. How often do we end up hating ourselves for what we did? rather than looking to Jesus and looking to Him for what He has done for us. Instead, we write our own version of the Bible. God helps those who help themselves. American Way, chapter 1, verse 1. Thanks for the offer of your son, God, but we'll fix it ourselves. We'll make up for our mistakes with contributions, our guilt with busyness, our failures with hard work, and we'll find salvation the old-fashioned way. We'll earn it. Jesus, on the other hand, simply asks us to trust him. Trust that his sacrifice is sufficient to cover our sins. Trust that through Him we'll be welcomed back into relationship with our Heavenly Father. Trust that we can be born again, spotless and pure. Jesus simply tells us to trust Him, to do what we can't. It shouldn't even be that weird for us to do. We trust other things in little ways all the time. We have confidence that the chair that that we sit in will support our weight, and so we sit on it. We believe that water will rehydrate us, so we drink it. We trust that a switch will turn on a light, and so we flip it. We have faith that a doorknob will open a door, so we turn it. We often trust in power we cannot see to do things that we can't accomplish. Jesus simply asks us to do the same with him. Just him. Not Moses, not me, not some other spiritual leader, not some other sin-bitten soul, not even ourselves. We can't fix ourselves. Only Jesus. Look to Jesus and believe. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the writer tells us, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Like my story about the zip line, at the end of the ropes course, Jesus is beside us, encouraging us to step off the platform into the unknown. He's asking us to settle into him like a harness so he can carry our heavy burden. And he's waiting for us at the end of the line with his arms open wide to welcome us into the kingdom that he has gone to prepare for us. As we listen to his voice of encouragement and trust him to carry us, he tells us to keep our eyes on him. He will guide us home. Like me in that zip line, taking my eyes off the ground and fixing it on my goal, It helped me to get over my fear. Getting me there 
to the cheers of my friends at the end. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, he will bring us home as well, with him to the cheers of those who have gone on before us. My challenge for you this week is to settle into Jesus, trusting that he will carry you home. Submit to his work on the cross and to save you from your sin. And cheer on those around you to do the same. Amen. This brings us to a time of communion. A time when we share together with Christ as well as one another as the body of Christ. In preparation for this time, I'd like to read a passage of Scripture from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were designed for. I bring this up because of this phrase, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. That's what we do with Jesus. That's the point of our entire message today, and it's the point of what we do as we gather together to partake of the Lord's Supper. We remember the sacrifice of Jesus, and we trust that it is sufficient to cover our sins. God has made him a precious cornerstone, a chosen cornerstone, upon which everything is built. And we trust that that cornerstone in Christ is sufficient. That through Christ we are drawn back into relationship with our Heavenly Father, as we talked about earlier. And so today, as we partake of this bread, we remember the broken body of our Lord and Savior, that chosen and precious cornerstone upon which our faith, our, our belief, our church, everything that we know and experience is built. Let's partake. And as we partake of this juice, we remember as well the shed blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for our forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we are able to be here together, that we are able to share in this time of worship, and that we are able to, to settle in to that chosen and precious cornerstone who is your Son. And Father, help us to trust in what he has done to trust in who he is, that in him we have salvation. In him we are drawn back into relationship with you. And Father, we thank you. And we pray these things in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. 
I thank you for the opportunity to be with you today, to be able to share the, the Word of God with you as we've unfolded John 3.16 and the surrounding context once again for you. And I look forward to the next time, either in person, beginning with our Sunday school hour at 9.30 at the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ in southeast Minnesota, followed by our worship time at 10.30. Or, once again, right back here online, initially posted on our Facebook page at 11 a.m., and then reposted on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, as well as our website. If you would like to help support the ministry of the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ, you can do so by sending either your tithes or offerings to the address on the screen beside me. You can also find this address at pleasantgrovechurchofchrist.com along with much, much more for your spiritual growth and development. I thank you once again for allowing me into your homes to unfold the scriptures for you today. God bless, and stay well.